Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor Grub Street. I'm delighted to introduce this virtual event with Linda Ray Fung, presenting her new novel, Swimming Back to Trout River, in conversation with Wakey Wang. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's new Voices in Fiction series presented with Grub Street, highlighting debut novelists discussing their work and the writing process. We're looking forward to hosting Paul Mendez for his debut novel, Rainbow Milk, next Wednesday, June 9th at 5 p.m. in conversation with Brian Washington. And you can learn more about this and the rest of our upcoming schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Closed captions are available for this event. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Swimming Back to Trout River on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers here at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Born in Shanghai, Linda Ray Fung has lived in San Francisco, New York, and Toronto. She is a graduate of Harvard and Columbia Universities and is currently a professor of Chinese cultural history at the University of Toronto. She has been twice awarded a McDowell Fellowship for her fiction, and her prose and poetry have appeared in journals such as The Fiddlehead, Kenyan Review Online, Santa Monica Review, and Washington Square Review. Waiki Wang is the author of the acclaimed novel Chemistry. She is the recipient of the 2018 Penn Hemingway A Whiting Award and the National Book Foundation Five Under 35. Her work has appeared in Plowshares and The New Yorker, among other publications, and has been featured in the 2019 Best American Short Stories and O. Henry Prizes. She earned her MFA from Boston University and her BA and SD from Harvard. She currently lives in New York City and teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. Tonight, they'll be discussing Linda's highly anticipated Swimming Back to Trout River. Her debut novel interweaves the stories of Junie, a child sent to live with her grandparents in rural China in the 80s, her parents, Momo and Kasha, who have left for America and whose relationship continues to fracture in their new country, and Don, a gifted violinist who Momo met as a young man. In turn, this intimate and lovely novel deftly examines their griefs, ambitions, and compromises, and the marks left on their lives by the Cultural Revolution. It also contains some of the most remarkable writing about music that I've ever read. Peter Ho Davies writes, Swimming Back to Trout River is notable for the grace of its prose and the harmony of its intertwined narratives, but the essential beat of this wonderful fiction is the heartbeat of its characters so richly and lovingly brought to life. And Garth Greenwell raves, everything in this gorgeously orchestrated novel surprises, everything outraces expectation. Swimming Back to Trout River is one of the most beautiful debuts I've read in years. So without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Linda and Waiki. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was a great introduction. Um, I feel like for some of these events, you know, Linda, you always read something or there's a scene that you know, you go to, and I know we're kind of in conversation about this, but I'm always curious when um, a reader thinking about like what to read from or um, where to go to start. Do you have a favorite scene that you go to for this book that, you know, you would always read out loud or you always would mention? Uh, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, um, I think, well, I, I can only go by the, the last time I did this, which is I, I read the dentist scene. 
Um, this is where um, Momo and Kasha meet for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's absolutely my favorite, favorite scene. In I, I, want, I want you to read it because I just, I remember hearing your event before and you have a great reading voice, which I'm quite jealous of. <laughs> okay, now it's going to be my test to see if I can actually find it uh, in my book. Hmm. Um, Okay, yes, I think I, I have it. <laughs> Do you want me okay, to great. Yeah, just read a little bit. I sort of love um, hearing, whenever you know I see a new book, I always like hearing just like how you sound with the paragraph, how you sound with the words. It, it sort of matched very well your reading voice, your writing voice with sort of the poignancy of your prose. And it's about teeth. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell the readers uh, that it's, this is um, page 71, which is, okay. um, uh, you know, just a, about a third way into the novel. And really all you need to know is that uh, the main character, two of the main voice characters are meeting for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it's from um, a chapter called Wisdom Tooth. Momo took pride in his robust constitution and the fact that having thrown himself into his job as an engineer, he kept his mind and body in tip top shape. But it was 1973, the year after the national ping pong team traveled to America and back that Momo's teeth began to torment him. This was something rooted in his makeup, bred in the bone, one might say, because Momo had inherited from his father a set of bad teeth. The day the back of his mouth began to swell so much that even turning his head took some effort, Momo had no choice but to bicycle through the industrial landscape of Silver Gourd Mountain to the clinic, which had been a stable before the factory was built. He passed the pair of spherical polyethylene tanks, now painted white with red slogans. One of them read, first, do not be afraid of hardship. The other one read, second, do not be afraid to die. Momo was very much feeling the hardship of his tooth, his jaw, and indeed his entire person. At the clinic, he was greeted by Dr. Fan, who was both the doctor and dentist. They already knew each other from their Marxism study sessions. Momo pointed to the back of his jaw. Dr. Fan washed his hands in a basin, wiped them off on his coat, which looked more like a butcher's uniform, and pried open Momo's mouth. I've never seen such severe misalignment, he said, as if he'd stumbled upon a new species of mushrooms in the woods. Momo waited. Dr. Fan angled his head lower and squinted again into the recess of his mouth. Did you know, he said, taking a step back to rummage for something, that the per capita toothpaste consumption in developed nations is seven tubes per year. In China, in China, it's one tube a year. Momo tried to think about the numerator and denominator in this aggregate number and many other such numbers that needed to be raised. It must have been pulled down by the rural population, he managed to say. <laughs> it's a national disgrace, Dr. Fan. Uh, mumbled. He had found a flashlight and directed its beam inside Momo's mouth. You're getting a wisdom tooth, Dr. Fan mumbled. Uh, Dr. Fan told him, given your misalignment, it's bound to hurt. He elaborated on this oddity of human evolution, how these vestigial molars creep up in people just when they think they are ready, safely out of reach of all growing pains. Can you get rid of it? Momo said. We will eradicate it, Dr. Fan said, like we eradicate counter revolutionaries against the proletarian people. The pain from being handled was making Momo drool. This was also when he noticed Dr. Fan had an assistant with him, a woman who looked to be his age. She had a white surgical mask and was fiddling with the bottles on the counter for minor maladies, alcohol for prepping, and a large bottle of mercurochrome for disinfecting cuts. We have a bit of anesthesia, Dr. Fan said, but best if you close your eyes. So, so Wonderful, <laughs> thank you for that. I actually, it's you know remarkable. I didn't even tell you to think about this scene, but this, this, this scene has one of my favorite details. Uh, it's the toothpaste, the, the seven tubes per year in developed nations and one in China. 
how did you find that? Or was that something that you sort of knew off the top of your head? You know, it, it, I, I have to answer this honestly. It, it's, there's two possibilities. I, I may have come across it when I was like an elementary school student. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but it could also be that I made it up and thought that I had read it as an elementary school student. But it's just, it's been an amazing detail. And, you know, um, my MFA mentor was Hajin Trefe, and he's always like, there, every book has this great detail that sometimes when you read it, you will remember forever. And I will remember that. I, I will remember a lot of scenes in your book. That one, this scene in particular struck me as just particularly, there, there's humor because, <laughs> because you're eradicating things and it's a metaphor for something larger like the social movement. And this toothpaste detail is just so precise. Um, and it's funny because of, you know, this like, whole idea of going to the dentist and being so fearful of going to the dentist. And yet, of course, you would be fearful if your dentist started talking politics to you as well. Um, and just the specificity of that scene, I really liked it. I'm so glad you read that. Um, but also, it is one of my, my favorite scenes. I, I sort of um, liked how you put that together. Um, so thank you for reading <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you like that detail. And uh, well, I think what I like about it, because, you know, I sort of have like a weird statistics background. And I like that they say that the rural, the rural population lowers the average. I thought, oh, wow, that does make a little bit of sense because the average is more subjective to outliers than the median. And obviously that. <laughs> and I thought this very smart, very smart scene. Um, so that uh, that was wonderful to read. Um, so I wanted to kind of jump into um, thinking about sort of how, you know, how we write a novel, how we put characters together. You have quite a large cast. Um, and I imagine dealing with a large cast as a debut novel and just as any novel is quite difficult. You have multiple generations, you have multiple continents and countries, right? Um, and you have children, you have parents, you have children who are going through hardship um, and you have parents who are also very separated. Um, I'm curious of how you jug, juggle connectivity between characters. That's something that I just personally have trouble with since, you know, if you have a, the bigger your net, the harder it is to write the scene. Party scenes are notoriously hard to write, right? That's why I don't, I don't write any party <laughs> scenes. Um, but, but also novels with so many characters, pulling them together is kind of like a big party. Um, I'm, just sort of, I'm interested in how you're keeping control of everyone and juggling that so well. Well, <laughs> I wish I had a, a, a better answer, um, but the honest answer is that um, I, 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 did, I, uh, I wish that I had um, chosen something much easier to do. <laughs> uh, in retrospect, I, I, there have been moments when I thought, why, why did I decide, why couldn't I have a first person narrative? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which takes place within like like a summer and um it, it, all of that would be so attractive but um but the honest answer is that well there's 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 two potential answers one of them makes me look better than the other the first one yeah, the, the, the more sort of optimistic answer is that i just felt um i needed to tell a story that was that was complicated and is complicated by having multiple generations multiple continents and and people um and that i wanted to uh, take the longer view of 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 human lives um and to look at the transition from one uh one generation to another and see what what's being passed down through stories through experiences through choices that parents make on behalf of their children um sometimes good ones sometimes bad ones um so that's the sort of um the the the, the answer that makes me look better the other <laughs> great answer i love that <laughs> the other answer is that um I, this is a novel that I wish um, I could have written in the omniscient point of view, <laughs> but I just simply couldn't pull it off. Um, and, and to and to 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 tell the story um, and and make it believable in an omniscient point of view. And the reason I, I'm particularly partial to an omniscient point of view is is that I. You know, as a writer, I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but sometimes you get a, you get into a power trip and you think, what is the point of being a writer if you can't be yeah. omnipotent and omniscient? Yeah. And 
and I want to do it. Uh, I wanted to, 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 to do that, but I just, you know, there's so many, it's so difficult. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've, you've had um, sort of no, thought. The God, the God lens is really, it is hard to pull off, right? It, it takes a great deal of skill. You have to know so much. Um, I, I, I agree with everything that you said. Third person can be incredibly hard when you have a lot of characters, especially when the story sometimes jumps perspectives and jumps time, right? You know, I'm always telling my stories, don't jump time and jump characters. Otherwise it becomes harder to control. Um, and I think you did an excellent job of it in terms of handling all of this so well. Um, personally, I think I favor, I just generally favor the first person, but sometimes I favor the third if I wanna do a short story. Um, you know, the third person past is always considered this like, mighty um, novelistic voice, right? Um, and the first person gives that more immediacy, that elasticity. So I always marvel at someone who can do a third person well. It's something I'm always scared to do um, just because there, there's quite a few loose ends, right? You have to plan out everything well. You have to map out the interconnectivity between the characters. You have to make sure there's payoff with this introduction of characters and that one. Um, and and your novel isn't, you know, 5,000 pages. So that's yeah. also a marvel that it was able to be contained in sort of this like very, you know, precious gem of kind of these pages. So that's also quite commendable. Did you outline anything in that way? You know, again, I wish I could say that I had, <laughs> I had a great <laughs> method for doing this, but there's actually um, no method that I can I can remember. Yeah. Um, I can say that, you know, again, you know, this was my, I, I was learning to write really as I was doing this, right. um, and, you know, and I, 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 I just, uh, I was, I was reading short stories um, to learn to write a novel, which probably isn't the best mm. way forward. Um, Did but, your editor help with you a little bit with that kind of like pacing throughout? Because it is paced really well, so you know. Definitely toward the end, uh, you know, when, when I had a finished manuscript, uh, my editor, uh, Zach Knoll, um, had a wonderful input on uh, kind of sort of like tightening things up and getting, yeah. getting the scenes, um, you know, really to really shine. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, definitely. Um, and, and I, but I can say that like at the very beginning, I was just, um, I, I didn't have any kind of plan. <laughs> I didn't have kind of any strategy. Um, I can say that um, the, the two characters that sort of came to me more or less more vivid than others um, are Momo and Juni. Right. And I had right. originally envisioned, and this is a, a, a symptom of my, my really not knowing at the time <laughs> the difference between a short story and a novel. You got you to give yourself more credit than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, it, was, it, it is a process. But, um, you know, I, I started thinking that maybe I'll write three stories, three short, oh, long short stories. I, I can see that. I can sort of see it's kind of like link stories a little bit separated you know, with Dawn's yeah. story and Momo's story and Junie's story, right? It, it sort of feels, that's actually, I never thought about that. I'm glad you said that. It's kind of like link stories, but integrated in such a full way that it feels like, you know, the complete novel, right? Yeah, I really like that idea, but also just that um, I, I wanted to get to the, 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 the end of a story. <laughs> and, you know, like you said, it's not a 5,000 page novel because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm inherently an impatient person. So I, I wanted to see things kind of finish and <laughs> wrap right. up. Um, and yet, you know, they, 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 you can't do it without um, sort of fulfilling their internal logic and mm -hmm. you know the generations have to you know be given their due and right. so um anyways just all of that is to say uh to make a long story short there was no outline <laughs> that i yeah can... i ask this of every writer i only ask is not to torment them but because i tell all my <laughs> students to alan and i never outline this is like oh, the teacher <laughs> never does what you know you tell your student to do this but you never do it but you hope that they'll do it and they'll show you that it's sort of like you got to practice. Um, I try to outline. I always outline after the work is done and then we edit it. It's one of the most inefficient process writing is. Um, 
but I mostly write in the first person. So sometimes my cast is kind of small and it's easier to sort of follow that linearly. I just can't imagine do, keeping all of this in your head. You know, the, the thing is a novelist has to keep the entire novel in your head. Like, you know, every inch of this novel. Um, and that's quite a bit of brain space um, in terms of <laughs> so many characters, so many decades and just so many kind of movements happening, right? Like the Cultural Revolution was a huge movement that really changed a, a full generation of people and how they raised their children um and and sort of to keep that in the background it's in the background which I, I thought was masterful sometimes you know that something takes over a story like you see someone say this took over a story right and it didn't it was just what happened and I, I thought you handled that quite well um in, in ways that you know I felt was sort of very poignant um but impactful. Um, I think one of the scenes I really admired was the scene with, you know, I, I'm not gonna give anything away, just Don, <laughs> the grandfather, the violin, the red guards. You, I think you know the scene that I'm talking about. Um, and I think I read that scene probably like five times just because of how things in the scene moved and how people spoke and how it was, the tension was kind of racked up. Um, and I'm, I'm curious of that, for me, you know, that scene would have been incredibly hard to write. I'm wondering if any scene like that was hard to write or, or if that was kind of an easy scene to write, bringing in history, but bringing in the family at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, thinking about, first of all, it, it is very difficult to keep uh, all, all these timelines yes. <laughs> in your head and I struggled with it. And, um, and so even though I don't outline, I do have a weird kind of like timeline yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you call it, but, um, you know, just to keep myself um, right. kind of organized. And then I also have this like weirdly geeky, like color coding system uh, in my, <laughs> in my file to keep track of how I've cycled through the characters. So, so no, it, there's no outline, but I, something in my mind did want to keep sort of like a, a cheat sheet for myself mm -hmm. in terms of how to, um, kind of like space out the the, the narrations and um so yeah in terms of particularly challenging scenes um and then how to keep the story and backstories together um I I guess I'm fortunate in that I grew up uh with uh extent large extended families on both sides of uh, my both my parents uh, sides of the family and so there was a lot of um, kind of oral storytelling. Oh, wow. There was a lot of kind of transfer of, 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 of really just like a narrative of, you know, of, of lives, of, of progress, of, um, you know, moments of birth. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of key highlight in, of, of childhood, of adulthood, of adolescence and kind of like jokes. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, the benefit of that is that I've, I've always been very comfortable kind of carrying that around with me. So, you know, I know, uh, for example, from my grandparents telling me the, the you know, the, all the kind of the, the different uncles and my, <laughs> the different cousins who have done things. And, <laughs> And maybe also it's because when you're a young child, you 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 latch onto details, mm -hmm. and uh, the, these kinds of details kind of stay with you, mm -hmm. and they kind of help you with organizing timelines. Um, I'm not saying that these are you know the same stories, but um, they, you know I've had practice, <laughs> I, you know, right. as, as you can uh, say, with keeping kind of multiple layers of stories yeah. um, all you know in my head as I, I accumulate those kind of details um, but in terms of that particular cultural revolution um, moment right. um, I've also been uh, in you know it, it has always been a, a kind of a pastime of mine to I, I always pay attention to those anecdotes when they come my way so um, you know a really odd um, particularly, you know, and, and also traumatic and key moments um, in, the, in, the, in people's experiences from the very minute to the very large uh, in the Cultural Revolution. And um, not just from, you know, my parents' generation, my, my uncle's, aunt's generation, but also people, um, you know, close, you know, like older and younger. And somehow, I guess I've been gathering, subconsciously, I've been gathering those anecdotes and material uh, for, for a long time, long before I knew I was gonna write anything. So, um, and, and one of the, you know, the things that I, I, I think about is that 
um, it's it's very difficult to try to understand, uh, you know, a, a time that um, for those people who actually experience it don't always um, they don't come through in in you know in the oral storytelling as as clearly and as readily as I would like, and so something about that that difficulty that sort of you know the, the limit of the language when when those stories are told kind of make my ears perk up and I kind of just uh, think about them even more and I kind of pay more attention and sort of it just snowballs. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I thought it was a perfectly balanced scene of, you know, when I'm always reading, I'm always reading, can I, can I teach this scene? Cause then I, <laughs> I, it's like everyone wins, but it's a perfect amalgam of tension of fear, but then the end result is sort of, kind of what you thought would happen at the beginning, but then you've been on edge the entire time through a scene um, and the dynamics are great. I think thinking about relationships, you're a master with crafting relationships, believable, um, bringing characters together immediately, having that confrontation, but not necessarily fumbling that confrontation and also being great at, you know, keeping characters at a distance. I think that's also something um, that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to touch on, um, you know, this book is about music and thinking about music, but I think one of the best, or at least, you know, I have so many favorite chapters, but I really love that chapter, The Improviser's Guide to Untranslatable Words in this book. Um, it felt sort of like a very nestled um, section, and it was just three Chinese phrases that you gave us a translation for, but not in, you know, the Webster way or the Chinese dictionary way, but just like full fictionalized stories, but full of life definitions. And that's never been done. I don't think I've ever read a book that does that. So first of all, I was surprised, um, marveled, but also I wanted to ask you about kind of the idea of translation. Um, oftentimes I feel like I'm constantly translating everything I'm thinking or saying. Um, you know, when you're writing sometimes the dialogue of the grandfather or the dialogue of the Red Guard, when they're speaking in Chinese, you have to transfer it to English in a way that's natural, but also captures the cadence of a language that English doesn't have, right? It's not the same staccato. So, and that makes me think of music and that makes me think of kind of thinking about rhythm in, in writing, which is what every writer thinks about. So I'm curious when you were writing this was kind of thinking about translation and thinking about how certain languages, the musical language and also English and Chinese have to meld to, to, to sort of respect a form in your prose. Yeah, no, I definitely think about translation all the time. Um, it's kind of, um, you know, I, I just as part of my job, I, <laughs> I know it's part of your job, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I was, I was, I was just telling you that I was reading your New Yorker story, uh, you know, yesterday, and I was thinking about, you know, I think it's the trip where the, yeah. the protagonist uh, is is you know thinking about cool and cool and strong like these two words that that yeah. could both mean cool yeah. um, but they there are they have shades of difference and, right. and, and if it's one of the key moments when the protagonist realizes that her cousin sort of um, yeah. is taking issue with her use of of those words um, yeah. and that's a wonderful example of when um, a translation. Kind of like a word as, as sort of something that you go to almost unthinkingly um, kind of fails um, in translation or that you have failed as a translator to deploy it in a way that it, it ought to be deployed or you want to deploy it um, so I, I struggle with that all the time and um, and you know just you know even thinking about the names of characters or how to how to name them, uh, the places, <laughs> the place names. Um, I'm const I'm constantly thinking about, you know, what would this be? How how would I generate this that would make sense uh, in in Chinese? Uh, you know, is this something that's uh, so I'm constantly thinking between the, the two languages, um, and I just um, I just like the idea of playing with. The futility of translation because it sort of gives me a way to it is so futile right <laughs> it is, so it is. That just don't work you can't get the nuance across and then um I, I mean I do I love the name Judy and I think it really captures her spirit but you know I think that was a choice on your part to not 
give her that you know short nickname Chinese in Chinese but just to convey it in English that gets the same spirit across and I admire that aspect of the translation too and I'm guessing that's a conscious choice that you're thinking about with character names with how they speak I think dialogue right yeah um I mean I, I think probably it's fair to say that in choosing the names of the characters which as you know is a <laughs> It's so also hard. It's so hard. That's why I don't name anyone. It's so I, hard to choose. I think it's a great uh, strategy. And I was, <laughs> you know, to, to, to go off on a slight tangent, I was also thinking about the different strategies that writers uh, yeah. deploy for, for naming. I was thinking about Italo Calvino in Cosmic Comics. Um, oh. he, all of his narrators uh, have the same name, which is <laughs> the, the unpronounceable Kuf Kuf. <laughs> Q F W F. Wow. Q. Anyways, it's a palindrome as well as unpronounceable, oh. um, and it's Calvino's kind of like wink at the at the really the futility of naming your characters, um, especially when they're kind of like cosmic <laughs> characters right. and talking right. about galaxies. Yeah. Um, but you know, different different writers have different strategies to kind of. Um, you know, counteract that futility. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's, you know, uh, yeah, maybe the next book I'll do something different, but I do like your strategy of not naming them. Well, well, no, in the second book, I've tried to name everyone, which is great. Okay. And my editors really, but I, 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 it's a question I get asked a lot, like, why don't you name your characters? I think sometimes naming things come with identity, things that you might have to unpack. Um, and sometimes that's something I don't want to necessarily get into the prose because then it takes over the story, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I thought you did a really good job with the names. The, it captures the spirit, but also it, it just gives it the vibe of, um, I get a sense of what this character is, but yes, the name is in English and that probably wouldn't be what they were, were called in their own country. But I, I, I sort of understand the idea of giving them that fluency of the English language, even if they are not fluent in that language. Um, things well, that's a really nice way of putting it. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I, think about, I think about it a lot, like how do I, I never want anything to be lost in translation, right? But then you want to give them access to this language that you have that they don't have, right? Um, and that's, you know, when I'm reading kind of your dialogue, it always feels so natural. It never feels like, there was this stop in between of they're speaking in this language and they have to transition. You just let us know now they're speaking in Chinese or now they're speaking English and it moves very fluidly. Um, it's something that I'm always like, students, you should do this, this is amazing. Um, but it kind of reminds the reader of these things but never gets in the way of the storytelling. And I think that's a testament to kind of your oral storytelling, right? Oral storytelling a lot of the times has that naturalistic way of speaking. It, it, you have to, otherwise, the, you know, the, the, the person would fall asleep, right? <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> um, all right, so, so um, thinking about translation a lot, it, it is important, I think, jumping back and forth. Um, did you have to, you know, I want to kind of mention a little bit of like the musical aspect of this, because it is such a book about music um, and writing about music. I've been writing on my music almost impossible. I think it's because I'm tone deaf. That's probably why it's impossible because I can't tell the difference between the notes. But but I'm asking, what is, you know, um, writing about music is notoriously hard and difficult to kind of translate that, you know, the note, the rhythm and the way that the melody sounds. Um, how how do you, did you, did it come very naturally to you? Um, you know, the violin, the, um, what, sort of was was there a vehicle for that kind of writing for you yeah that's uh, so so music is also like translation in the sense yeah um, it's it's the same kind of um I guess enterprise because um it doesn't no it doesn't come so the short answer is it doesn't come naturally um and there is a futility <laughs> involved do you play an instrument ever I, so you know full disclosure I played uh in the high school orchestra, in my high school orchestra okay. for two years, but you know, not as any kind of distinguished <laughs> player of any kind. But what I did have uh, was an experience where basically I had no plans to be in the orchestra, but my really, really good friend at the time kind of just dragged me into it and, <laughs> and sort of like pulled me aside at like lunch hour and gave me the, the sort of the essentials of what, what I needed to know to like read music enough to like have 
you know, to, to get, and then like we practice together. And so I had this kind of almost, almost Momo like <laughs> experience where a friend was like, like you know, inducting me into yeah. this world. Uh, but the short, you know, so the, the short answer is that I'm not, uh, you know, uh, by any stretch of the uh, imagination musical in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I'm I'm drawn to instances where, um, you know, sort of like my bread and butter, which is language, mm -hmm. uh, fails and fails miserably and comically. Mm -hmm. And I just when that happens, I just want to keep going <laughs> and mm -hmm. push it as far as I can uh, mm -hmm. to make it perform, <laughs> you know, the impossible. Um, so I, um, you know, I thought a lot about what music would be like to an outsider, which is not hard, wow. uh, <laughs> and, 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 and how an outsider might want to, might, might get in, like through the intervention of, of a friend or through their own sort of, um, you know, later uh, understanding of what that world is, or to have a little bit of both, as in Momo's case. I think he he got the basics, he got the music education that really that that was that he could have um, as a young man, as a as a undergrad um, university student. But it took him years for for the sort of the lesson or the sort of the, the, to you know the appreciation to set in and it took his immigration and his you know his leaving and his being in an entirely different place uh from where that uh, musical education started for him to like actually come around to that effect of that that attempt at education um so i think about that a lot and i think about how uh it is how how we can come close to articulating like a phenomenal uh, performance that affects us but we might not be able to explain mm -hmm. and uh, so so that that was a, a challenge that i just felt um you know i i it was there's no end to the to the to the kind of stimulation <laughs> Of, of that challenge and so it, it kept me going mm -hmm. um and of course i did i did research i tried to um you know read a lot of uh you know writing about music um you know pop music uh classical music mm, and wow. uh try to you know try to figure out how to do this um and i'll also say that i'm i'm also interested beyond music i'm also interested in how like how to write about food how to write about smell <laughs> All of these things that language. How to write about food? Oh, taste. Oh, oh taste. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and how to write about scent, right? Like, you know, like the big world. one. Yeah. Um, in which you know, again, language fails <laughs> miserably. You just have, all you have to do is pick up a wine review, right? And <laughs> you can see how that does not work. Um, it's true. I mean, my mother-in-law says everything that she drinks, like every liquor is smooth. That's her one adjective for all alcohol is smooth. I actually don't know what the, like the antagonist of that is like Rocky. Like this is, like Rocky. <laughs> this is Rocky. I don't, I've never heard her say it. So, so it's true. Yeah. There's like taste is a big one. It's the senses, like the scent, ear. It, it's, it's hard because, you know, when I, you know, when you're writing so much of the writing is like, what do you see? right color you know we see color we see movement we see distance we see shapes right but the other senses are so hard to write about um and 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 that's i think the challenge that's been the challenge for all writers is trying to figure out how to write about the other senses in a way that's not just sight um and music is, is incredibly it's just translating that into words is sometimes really difficult yeah and i i think that you know if we are to write about you know, human experience and memory and all that. Um, like it's part of me is like stubbornly trying to <laughs> get that tool that, you know, yeah. that, that's very difficult to actually have, which is, mm. you know, I, I want to keep working at uh, describing music, describing scent, describing all of these kind of intangible or maybe un unseen. It's, like, it's true, language does work mm -hmm. relatively well with, with sight, um, but then I want to push it to do things that it usually cannot do. Of course. Um, I know it, 
it's a little early for Q and A, but I thought this question actually kind of blend in really well with um, what we're talking about. Um, one person wanted to know, I love to know how your work as a poet has influenced your prose writing style. What is the hardest thing about writing poetry to translate into writing fiction and vice versa? So translating between forms like hmm. prose. Yeah, so um, I, I I don't write a lot of poems, but I, I did start out writing poems before I started writing. Um, uh, I wonder how this person knew you as a poet then. That's just, like, I, I don't know. I, I can't amazing. see the Q&A, so I'm not sure who it is, but- uh, It says anonymous, but- I know, um, <laughs> this is very intriguing. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, um, I think, um, I think, you know, the honest answer is that I actually had to um, sort of unlearn some of the habits of, of writing poetry when I started writing wow. uh, uh, fiction, which is that um, in poetry, you kind of have to stay with a moment, yeah. and kind of dive very deeply into a moment, and you kind of go down as far as you can, <laughs> until you can't go any further, um, but with um, with with fiction you kind of have to think about movement you think you have to think about pacing and right. you have to think about getting to the end of a scene that has that makes uh, at this uh, in which some kind of change has occurred i'm sure you teach that <laughs> in your class no, I, I think i say well the one thing that a poet never has to write and a prose writer always has to write is like connective tissue no one wants to talk about connective tissue but you, you to get the, you have to say five years later this character is here right yeah there's no beauty in that you just have to write it and that is something in prose that is just somewhat different about the form right even though if you can you know there's something great about the um poetry being very image focused and i think you have some some of the greatest images of you know just that scene i was mentioning with the violin and don um but also you know your ending scene is so powerful you you it's very driven by these like solid images that kind of go very deep right and sort of the sounds of that um, but then the connective tissues in between these scenes is something a poet doesn't always have to worry about. Um, that's and a writer. A nice way, yeah, yeah, that's a nice way of putting it, connective tissues, because it is um, like a novel is, is like a larger entity and <laughs> its limbs sometimes are not, you know, so wieldy. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so it, it is a different, I guess the short answer is that there, there's a different relationship to time. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, you know, it, it took time to actually, to get to, to understand that difference. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right, right. No, I, I hear what you're saying about sort of learning to write as you're writing the novel. Um, I'm always trying to catch the beginning up to the, to the end, because by the time you're at the end, you're quote unquote, you feel like a much better writer and then you have to fix the beginning to catch up to that. Um, and it's just a longer piece of work, um, the novel. Um, um, but but I think it, it, it's sort of like, you know, a poem is sort of like this pearl, but once you get enough pearls, you have this like beautiful piece of art. And if you're lucky enough, that becomes a really great novel, so. Yeah. yeah, I also think that, you know, a nice thing about novels is that it can be, it could be more forgiving mm -hmm. that, that you could, um, if it's large enough, if its scope is large enough and ambitious enough, you could make some faux pas. Are you, <laughs> yeah. are you saying that, you know, like the thing that every novel has a flaw and the middle tends to, you know, drag or something for certain novels? <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm being optimistic and I'm, I'm saying that, you know, you can make small mistakes in a yeah. novel and a reader will forgive you for it, yeah. but maybe not for a poem. So, uh, and, and certainly not a short story. So, so short which stories. is why, you know, short, short stories are, are notoriously difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. Have you tried your hand at a short story or is it been just poetry to long form. I, I have I have and I'm I, I think uh, I would love to write another uh, short story soon um but like since I've ever since I've sort of got into the novel mm -hmm. I've sort of fallen out of the the, the sort of the, the the kind of things that that the kind of thinking that's required for a short story and I'm I'm still finding my way back to the short story um and it might take some time but i think that the, the sort of it's a it's a matter it's not just scale it's a it's a qualitative difference as you know <laughs> i love that you said scale because for me i never thought i would write a novel i actually am you know 
like it, it just, it's hard for me to believe um but the form of a short story is so it's the scale right and i always tell students but also people you need to find your material and you need to find your form and if your forms poetry if your form if what is your material how does that fit that form nonfiction, prose essay um that's very important and some people are just natural novelists like when i read your work i think you are a natural novelist first just your adaptation of the third person and just your ability to control time if you can control time you're god in a novel right um and your ability to do that without actually having an outline is actually quite amazing um, okay, so so let, let me just like, um, this question is actually kind of linked to sort of this link story thing. What do you see as the benefit of a connected intergenerational novel over the short stories you were originally planning for the book? How did that choice change what you were planning for the characters or outcome? Hmm. Did you sell it as three stories? You didn't sell it as sort of three link stories, right? No, I mean, those three links was ever really just a, like, An like idea. a figment of my imagination. Yeah. And as soon as I started writing one of them, um, I just, I think it was, it was not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> but I, you tried I, to write the first part. I did. I think that's okay. what, that's when the, the, the three stories. Was this, Mo, was this Junie's story or whose story was this? So, you know, what's really funny is that when, now when I tell people that I had a, a, imagined a three story format, I can't even remember what the third story is. Okay. <laughs> but well, I, I imagine it might have been Momo, Junie, and I guess Dawn, because I mean, but Cassie is also a strong character. So I guess I don't, you know. Yeah. So, the, so what I can, what I can remember is that, um, and it's, it's, it, well, I, I, I want to tell this because in some ways it's, it, it gets at what drives me about the the novel is that one of the short stories is I envisioned a, a woman who was uh, coming to America from having from you know experience the cultural revolution and goes into a church um, because you know people are trying to convert her to Christianity and she um, sort of hears the the singing in the church and the kind of the proceedings uh, in a Sunday worship and she had flashbacks from um, the Cultural Revolution, and she walks out of the church kind of feeling confused. Um, so, so what I had in mind was something that would grow around that story, <laughs> and then another story of Junie's. Uh, but now I can't remember what the third one is. So, um, so I guess the answer to that question is really that um, a, a novel, of course, uh, is a much fuller uh, <laughs> treatment of those problems. Uh, you know, what do you do? You know, they, they, it allows you to ask a lot more questions. You know, who is, you know, why does, what is this relationship between um, religion, organized religion in this case, and uh, what she experienced in, you know, in, in mass movements and mass like beliefs um, yeah. of a certain kind um, in her own past. Um, and then also how do the stories, uh, these kinds of different forms of, uh, you know, what you want to call it, you know, uh, how does one generation's coming of age sh shape the next generation's coming of age? Um, and like things like, how do you, you know, how do you decide for your child that they're going to leave their native country? And, you know, I know that that's also something that I, I was reading about in your, in your short story is, is the child does not make that choice. And so the novel allows me to ask that question, you know, what happens when a child refuses to immigrate? Um, and then, you know, what, what, well, and, and it really, it's, it, it allows me to think about the fact that um, immigration has two sides, it's the leaving and the arriving. And you know, what happens when you look more at the leaving uh, than the arriving? And so I kind of, I could use Junie's refusal to, to leave. Um, as a way to get at the other side of immigration, which is right. you know, the part that she doesn't uh, take take part in at the moment. I liked what you said about a full treatment of something that sometimes a linked series might not be able to achieve just because of the gaps and standalone piece stories are standalones right whereas sometimes you know you have to split up a story in half to accommodate it in a novel. Um, so, uh, so there, <laughs> these two questions are kind of linked. Um, what's the next project you have planned uh, directed at both speakers, but I'll answer after you because I want to know your answer. 
And would you ever consider writing a historical novel? <laughs> See, I actually do think you have the brains for it <laughs> and also the skill and the scope. That is actually quite a, a fascinating question. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll answer the historical novel one first. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm assuming that the, 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 um, the person means like something a little bit further back historically. Than yeah, like, right, right. Mm -hmm. Like um, historical fiction probably, or right, right, yeah, historical. Yeah, so, you know, in my scholarship, I work with very old stuff, like, you know, like ninth century uh, stuff. And people have always asked me, you know, would you uh, consider writing a historical novel based on the Tang Dynasty? And I don't know why I have not um, thought about it. I guess my answer is that um, I don't think about, uh, you know, my project in terms of historical novel or not. Yeah. Um, I just, I go to things that interest me and they, it might be from the 1980s, 1960s, uh, 2015, or it could be from the year 900. I'm not sure. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know right. until um, I've, I've sort of met that, that, that figment that will become a character. But in terms of the next project, um, yeah, thank you for asking that question. It's always nice to think about the next project. Um, I'm working on a, um, a, a story, well, a, a story that will probably be a novel um, that is um, kind of like a, a centered around um, a nanny um, who comes from China and three or four or two, I'm not sure, a number of children that she had brought up. So um, right. okay. like a story about the adult children uh, and, and, and the nanny. So that's where I'm at. So, so also oh. covering a long period of time, right? So it, it would, it's kind of also two generational, yeah. <laughs> five generational, yeah. but, but maybe not, um, not in the same way. Mm -hmm. So how about you? I love to hear. No, it's fine. <laughs> well, you already know, because I kind of complained to you about email, through email <laughs> about things. Um, tail end of the second novel. So dealing with, you know, the last minute edits, bounding the galleys, not big writing stuff anymore. Um, it's called Joan is Okay. I think it's supposed to come out next year, end of end of January. Um, yeah. And currently not writing anything. I'm really enjoying not writing anything because if I don't write anything, I don't need to talk to my editor. <laughs> and that is a great, <laughs> it's sort of a great kind of uh, piece right now because we sort of are coming off of a really long editorial process. Um, you actually had a great editorial process, which is good. I, my, my first book, Chemistry, I had a great editorial process. Not that this was bad, it was just different. You know, every editor is slightly different um, and you have to learn to work together. It's kind of like a marriage, but you're just married. You, you, you know, you didn't pick each other totally. <laughs> um, um, so I'm hoping that I just kind of write some stories and maybe put together a collection. I think thinking about a novel, a third novel is just too much work. It is a huge scope. and kind of bringing it together I think I just need a little bit of a break maybe I go on vacation or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, find that, I find that when I'm uh you know coming off of a big writing project I I get this like huge case of like um, I think of it as writer's envy, which is that I yeah. envy everybody who doesn't work with words. So like I would be oh, fascinated with true. people who, who, who do wonderful things with like building things, <laughs> who can like, you know, grow vegetables and uh, people who can- I think I should like, garden. That's a good idea. Or like direct cargo ships across the ocean. Like, you know, things yeah. like, that, like that start to fascinate me. Because. Right, right. Like other <laughs> jobs, like other skill-based yeah, right. jobs that seem much more practical. Um, okay, so one question is, what are you reading now or over the pandemic? Um, and what's coming out that you're excited about? Uh, is that for both of us? I think you can answer it. Um, I know I'm reading some Marilyn Robeson um, and, you know, just... I haven't been reading that much. I've been reading a lot more nonfiction. Um, like I, um, I read Minority Feelings um, and you know On Immunity um, by Ula Biss. I, I think when I'm writing a lot of fiction, I tend to read a lot of nonfiction because it, like I, I read like Rick Steves Travel Guides just because <laughs> yeah. I think I just need something other than fiction when I'm writing fiction. Um, but what about you? 
Well, I'm kind of in between books. So the last really um, great novel I read was, um, is Brandon Taylor's Real Life. Okay. Um, I absolutely love that book and I totally recommend it to everybody. Um, and so I'm about to start reading uh, Harold McGee's Nosedive. Uh, Nosedive, oh wow. Okay. It's about the world of smells. And it's like- Is a, this to help you with the scent? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, and of course, Harold McGee is a wonderful writer, just like, you know, in general. But when yeah. I discovered that he's writing, that he has this book on smell, I was just like, oh, my gosh. Wait, so this um, is not fiction, right? It's nonfiction. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's like the science and culture of smell. Oh uh, so, you know, as a chemist. <laughs> or no, a I'm actually I'm just going to Google. I'm writing this down. I'm typing it because I'm going to. That's actually fascinating. Um, I would love to read that book. I love this idea of just nonfiction and how we think about smell. You know, nonfiction is the training for fiction writers. You need to get that detail, like that detail about the toothpaste, right? Like that is a piece of nonfiction. And it's like how you weave it into a fiction piece that makes it so marvelous, but also so like fluid and just, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, and in chemistry, I really, one of the things I really loved it, like you like, you have these series of yeah, facts. I'm all, I'm all about facts. <laughs> that, I, that actually was doing so much work beyond the list. And, you know, right. I, I don't remember if I told you this, but like your list of things that, um, that the student of the protagonist re like finds, reminds them of her yeah. is so wonderful. Like that oh, thank was, you. <laughs> that was one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, and like lists could be so. Lists are great. Yeah. Um, they're, they're quick. <laughs> they're quick and they're kind of get to the point in terms of that. Um, but they do yeah, so much work so much. beyond just yeah. the list <laughs> and, right. and when you do them well as you did um, <laughs> they they just they do so much uh narrative work yeah heavy lifting actually it is you know my first um I had a great my I think teachers matter a lot that's why I like teaching or I'm teaching but Amy Hempel she's a great short story writer but she's always told us from the very beginning negative space Negative space is so important in, in art, right? In, in painting and in visual arts, silence, right? In music, where you put the rest um, is just as important as where you put the period. Um, punctuation, what is not said, um, that is equally as important as what is said. So I think that that's something I think about when I'm writing. Um, I think you do too, just like how your scenes are sort of crafted. It's, you never wanna over explain, right? But you wanna give some room for that reader and that is the white space, that's the imagination. If you create the imagination for the reader, they don't, they they feel like they're not sharing in that experience. Um, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm I'm all, I'm writing to readers who um, like I I feel like I can trust like yeah. I I can trust to do the do the work, do the work. Do the work. <laughs> yeah and and that gives me you know joy uh, yeah yeah well somebody one of my teachers told me you got to write to your smartest friend I was like okay well the narcissist in me is like well I'm my smartest friend right <laughs> but no I think it's like writing to your smartest reader writing assuming that your reader will get it in a way that um, you intended. Um, and it's, it's it's actually really a joy to like meet that reader. Um, and hopefully, I hope in your tour, you meet lots of these readers to sort of get what you were trying to do with scenes and how you're placing them together. Um, just like your ending, you had a fabulous ending, but I'm never, you know, we're not gonna talk about that. But I just wanted to mention that it really is memorable. Um, I think last question is, what's your advice for young authors trying to publish their debut novel, especially regarding navigating the agent and publisher process? Um, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom for that. Well, like, I, th I feel like you would probably be a better person to answer this, having now gone through this twice than me. No, well, I, I think you're a good answer. You, you have good answers because you can kind of write at any time. Like writing, there's no, there's no time limit, right? So you can sort of have a career and do great in that career and also choose to write a debut book, um, a fiction book. I think that's really important. Some people don't start writing until much later. Some people start writing earlier. Did you find the agent publisher process difficult? Um, well, it's definitely, a, it, it was a long process. And I guess the difference is that, you know, I, I didn't do an MFA program. Um, so I, 
I don't know, uh, like I, I sort of was doing everything kind of on my own learning yeah. agent process and like making a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, Were you I, looking online or sort of in books? Or I, I in did, I did go to sort of how to manuals, <laughs> on how to, um, but I think the, the biggest uh, mistake I made or the big, you know, sort of like the, the, the piece of advice um, I, I want to give people would be that, you know, write the best book you can and yeah. be patient and yeah. um you know I I all you know I again I'm speaking as someone who's very impatient I always wanted to to sort of show people things <laughs> before they're actually ready in retrospect mm -hmm. and um it takes it I, I guess you know it takes enormous amount of time for something to be ready mm -hmm. um but you know you don't know so sometimes it's always it's also just making mistakes so I guess maybe my advice would be don't be afraid to fail <laughs> As with anything in life um, it's true yeah. well were you when you started out on your academic career did you think you would end up you know here in this event as a fiction writer <laughs> no, um, answering no. questions about this and not your academic papers no definitely not definitely right. not and but you know that's also part of it. I think if I were thinking about where this would all lead to, I probably would never have, uh, you know, put the put in the time that was necessary to get it done. So, right. so it's kind of a necessary part, ignorance, maybe. Were you writing on the weekends and the mornings, and you know, just whenever you had free time? I think whenever I had free time, and I'm a horrible uh, routineizer <laughs> of of writing habits, so I just I just did it uh, whenever I could. Yeah. Um. And and you know I try to just like remember that, you know I want to tell the story and right. uh, and hopefully let that like direct me more than any other procedure. So. I mean, I think you're like what you said, sort of naturally falling into writing. Patience is really important. Write the best book that you can, um, and you'll find the agent. You'll find the editor. You'll find you'll find the agent. You'll find the reader. You'll find the editor. Um, that's really important. I'm not rushing into it because it is out there forever, and you can only. My editor says this every time to me, Waiki. You can only do a book once, and I'm like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I was going to publish a remix, like, you know, <laughs> but, but that's not going to happen. Um, so, so I think for young writers, it is a good piece of advice to stay patient, um, to write the best book, to finish a project. I think um, a publishing house and an agent, writing is probably one of the worst run businesses in terms of like thinking about advances and thinking about dedication. Writers are not the most reliable people. So I think it's like finishing a project showing them that you're good for your word. That's really important. So many of my writer friends are like, I need to wait for the right moment to finish this novel. And there is no right moment. You just have to do it every day and fix it every day and make mistakes every day, just like you said. Um, and, and prove that you're interested in the writing aspect of the novel and not the persona of the writer. I think that's really important. You know, sometimes th there is this great thing about being a writer, but um mostly every day is sort of grueling <laughs> and can be um but yeah finding finding a good mentor who can open that door for you is helpful as well um all right so so i think that's all of our questions um linda was there anything you wanted to add to tell talk to our audience tell our audience uh, well, no, but just thank you so much for talking with me and it's been so much fun and it's such an honor for me to be able to have this conversation. Yeah, likewise. I always like talking to fellow writers, um, especially writers I really admire who can obviously do something I can't. So, you know, so there's a little <laughs> jealousy and envy, um, but, but, but thank you for this great conversation about thinking about how, um, how this book came to be, right? I love the cover. I'm always talking about covers. I talk to covers about you. It's so clean and beautiful and so, it sort of captures the way that you read, the way that you write. Um, and so thank you for that, for, for joining us. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Linda and Waiki, for that beautiful conversation. Um, thank you everyone out there for joining us this evening. Please do yourselves a favor, check out Swimming Back to the Trout River on harvard.com. 
And on behalf of the Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you so much, guys.